Early on, we had little visitors in the night, and a hole in the wall was discovered. I remember my father covered the hole with glass, meaning we got a good view of a rat. Its life soon ended. Village life was fun. It was finding our way about and meeting lots of um, people who became our friends and, of course, walked, as many people didn't have cars. It was a, such a supportive community, no need to lock your doors. There were no shops or petrol stations, and making food planning was a major item. Most people had excellent gardens. Each Tuesday and Friday, the powerhouse truck brought our paper, grocery items, and filled petrol drums from Glen Tunnel and Colgate. And the meat came from Darfield, from Cridges, if I think I remember the name. A packed carton and a brown paper parcel was always left at our gate. Other food su supplies came from hobby pursuits, such as rabbiting, fishing, or other wildlife hunting. The Midland bus provided a return service from Christchurch three times a week. The mail and the paper of the day arrived. Sometimes staff going to sheep stations travelled this way. I'm sure some of you remember the station cooks, often arriving in a poor state after a spell at Colgate Hotel. They were left in a heap on the grass until the run holder came to transport them back to the station. The residents owned several cows. A cow club supplied the milk for all with Jack Cameron employed to milk the cows by hand morning and night. These cows were free to wander all around the village, so it was a task at the end of the day for some of the school children to go and find the cows and bring them back for milking. A big happening in our lives was in 19, um, 1946 when we had a 6.2 earthquake in June at 12.34 a.m. I still remember it, and I was quite small. I remember it was a very cold, clear night, and Dad dashed from the, and Mum from the bed to check on us and then to retrieve goods. And I can remember Dad putting the clock from the mantelpiece on the floor and... Um, Preserves our mother had sweated over preparing on very hot days were all on the laundry floor, which we called the wash house in those days, <laughs> mixed with smashed glass, and many chimneys were badly damaged, and outside cracks were discovered on the ground. Some people left the village, but our mother said, we stay. Dad was still working. The aftershocks actually went on for three years. And I'm quite sure this experience gave us strength to cope with the hardships here over recent happenings. Our father always encouraged us to accept the inevitable and do whatever we needed to do. Get on to it, he would say. My sister has certainly proved she could, coping with much, much liquefaction, a very damaged home, and with so many of their possessions broken or smashed, unfortunately she couldn't be here tonight. Village life was as busy as you wanted it to be. There were lots of clubs and interests, tennis, table tennis, cricket. And some of you might remember the wonderful cricket matches we used to have with the students from Lake Coleridge um, Homestead when they came up in their summer holidays. There was golf, skating, swimming, billiards and card evenings. And for the young people, there were always games in the school grounds after our dinner rounders, long balls, etc. And often the young single men came to join us and when dusk descended, we all made our way home. We were so fortunate to have a modern hall, which is still standing. An open fire was often used and tons of free firewood was available nearby. It just had to be cut and carted. Being a six-year-old school pupil, it was quite a shock to find our class was made up of five to 12 year olds, all in one large room. It was a lovely school and well placed for the sun. It was sheltered from the northwest by a wonderful macrocarpa hedge, a good play area, I might add. Our teacher was a very young Miss McLeod, Jean, who taught us well, and we loved her, and she would have loved to have been here tonight. 
We had a swimming bath on site, so everyone learned to swim. And some years later, it was the icy river and even exciting times in the towel race. Our parents didn't know about that. <laughs> we were so privileged when Mr Harry Hart, the powerhouse superintendent, took us on day trips to the Akron Diversion, or it could have been planting trees or climbing mountains. I think we needed to be about seven or eight for these treats. We learned so much about the flora and fauna, safety, companionship, and had great fun. The cookhouse at Lake Coleridge Homestead was always a welcome stop on the return journey. We used to sing, and he had to stop. And when we were nearby, Jack Anderson uh, provided us with delicious scones. It was really thanks to Mr Murchison, the owner of the station, for those. I'm sure he probably knew Meg. <laughs> Um, another milestone for me was VJ Day, um, August 1945, at the end of the war. My last major involvement with the district was in the late 90s over the planning and creating of the Lake Coleridge book with a group of other ex-residents, some of who are with us tonight. I will conclude my talk with a message from Jean McLeod Lewis, who was unable to be with us um, tonight. She was our secretary and a very alert lady at 94, and she still is. And this is what she sent. Greetings. It is a privilege to count as friends today some of my pupils from 1942 to 1945. At a reunion in 1996, a throwaway comment was made, let's have a book. This became a reality in the year 2000 when Lake Coleridge, the power, the people, the land was published. The result of four years research and hard work by the book group, our patient, meticulous, talented author Rosemary Britton and many willing and generous contributors. This book is a lasting tribute to the people who lived, worked, and loved in this beautiful area of the Upper Rakaia Valley. Thank you very much.